Hello students, this is Professor Sansom, and I'm going to be talking about experiment two. In this experiment, you will have to design your own procedure. We've given you detailed guidelines in your lab manual that should help you figure out how to do it. Just keep in mind, there's three important things. Number one, you have to figure out when you're gonna measure the temperature. Since we're talking about a change in temperature, the beginning and the end, uh, you just have to decide what does it mean for it to be the beginning and the end. Um, how do you treat those things? For example, at the beginning, you're combining different volumes of two solutions. So how will you know what the temperature is once you combine them together? And at the end, how do you know that it's the end? Um, what sort of landmark will you look for in the data to say, yes, this is the end? That's the first thing. The second thing is you have to come up with a plan for which volumes you're going to use of the unknown and of the bleach solution, the sodium hypochlorite. This is really important because you only have 50 milliliters of your unknown. So you have to be judicious in how you choose to plan your experiment to make sure that you'll be able to do the third thing that we ask of you, which is get four data points on either side of the peak stoichiometric ratio. So make sure you take those three things into account as you're planning your experiment. Now we're going to talk about how to set up the experiment. You will be using a styrofoam calorimeter, which is essentially a styrofoam block, and it has a hole in the middle where you'll place the dram vial. Inside the dram vial, you'll put your stir bar. Then you're going to put this whole thing on top of the stir plate. Be careful because your stir plates frequently also have a heat setting. You want to make sure that you're using the stir setting, not the heat setting. If you use the heat setting, it will melt your styrofoam block and it will smell bad and everyone will be very unhappy. Today, you'll be using the temperature sensor. Get out the temperature sensor that looks like a white shoelace and plug it into the wireless temperature link. After you've got this set up, you're going to put the thermometer, your fast response temperature sensor, into the vial and above the stir bar. You can go ahead and check using your adjustments that the bar is stirring appropriately. And then you'll be able to add your solutions into this system. In the event that your temperature reading is negative 273 Kelvin or infinity, that's an indication that something is not working quite right. Now I'm going to introduce you to the PASCO SparkView software. We'll get set up for your experiment and I'll point out some features that will come in handy in this lab and future labs. SparkView is the second program we will use frequently in this class. With our equipment, we can use it to measure pressure, temperature, pH, conductivity, and more. When you open this program for an experiment, you'll first click the Build New Experiment button. Next, we're prompted to select a layout to display our data on the screen. For this class, we'll use the first three options. Today, I'll choose the third one, which gives me two panels. The program is now asking us how we want our data displayed in each panel. There are many options, but in this class, we'll just use the first two. The first icon is a graph, and it will allow us to graph our data. The second icon is a number, 1.23, and it will display a numerical value of our measurements. Now that we can display our data, I'll give you a tutorial on how to use specific buttons in SparkView. Notice the buttons in the top left corner. The first is a button with three lines. This is where you'll save your data often and also where you can come back to view it. At the top right corner, the button with a camera will allow you to take snapshots of your data. The Bluetooth button allows you to connect your device to the SparkLink Air unit. At the bottom middle, we see a green dot that says start next to it. This is the button you'll use to have SparkView start collecting data, and clicking it a second time will stop collecting data. At the bottom right are some buttons used in changing our settings and configuration. You shouldn't normally have to worry about these buttons, but you'll use them in a later experiment to calibrate your equipment. Now let's look at the display panels. We've assigned the program a layout and type of display for our data, but now we need to tell it what we want to measure. We do this by clicking the Select Measurement buttons. For this experiment, we want to measure temperature, so I'll assign both of these panels to measure temperature in degrees Celsius. If your SparkView program isn't giving you the option to select a measurement, it's likely because the program can't connect to your SparkLink Air unit. 
If this is the case, try making sure your unit is connected by USB or Bluetooth. You should also make sure everything else is connected as it should be. Once a sensor is connected, like your thermometer, SparkView should be able to recognize it and allow you to select a measurement specific to that sensor. It could also be that you forgot to turn on the unit altogether. You turn it on and off by holding down the power button on the back of the unit. If none of these things work, get a hold of your TA or student instructor for help. On our graph, there's a toolbar that will be very helpful for looking at the data. We can expand it by clicking the graph button. I'll review some of the more helpful features of the toolbar. The first button is the scale to fit button. Clicking it will help see all of your data in a fitting scale. If you're having problems scaling, it could be because the X or Y axes are locked. You can unlock them by clicking the lock buttons here and here. The next button will allow you to toggle between dragging your view around the graph and an option that will allow you to select data by clicking and dragging to select a given area. This next button is the coordinate tool, which allows us to find the values for a specific point in our data. This button is the line of best fit tool. It will give a line of best fit through all our data or just the data we select. If you'd like to know more about these other buttons, you can check Appendix B at the back of your lab manual. The last thing that you'll have to do in this experiment after you're done with all of your trials is your waste neutralization. All of our solutions, once they've been pH neutralized, can be washed down the drain. So, in order to tell if your solution is neutral, gather all of your waste together in one beaker, and then add some of the bromothymol blue indicator. Bromothymol blue will appear yellow if your solution is acidic, and blue if your solution is basic. So, if it's yellow, you'll want to neutralize the acid using sodium bicarbonate. It's very, very important when you do this that you add only a small amount of bicarbonate at a time. For example, one spatula tip full. Um, this will bubble up and it can overflow if you add too much at one time. So you'll want to add a small amount and then stir it really well and then add a little bit more, etc., until it becomes green or until it just barely turns blue. Uh, that will tell you that it's been neutralized. If instead the solution is blue because it's basic, you'll want to add citric acid in the same manner, just a little bit at a time until it turns green, or if it just barely turns yellow, then that's okay also. Some of you will have an unknown that will behave badly in this neutralization, and it will make something that looks like sludge. Um, this doesn't happen all the time, but if it does happen, then the stockroom can help you. You can actually neutralize that with vitamin C. So if you ask the stockroom for a vitamin C tablet, you can crush it up and mix it in, and then it will uh, neutralize that problem. And this is the end of the pre-lab video for experiment two. Good luck!